It was a deadly weekend in Iran's notorious Avin prison where two Americans are still being held. A massive fire killed at least eight prisoners, injuring 61 others. Flames lit up the night sky in Tehran Saturday where witnesses could hear gunfire and explosions. Iran's judiciary blaming, quote, thugs for starting the fire. The blaze coming at a time of extraordinary protests across the country, with women leading the charge, many taking off their headscarves and cutting their hair in protest. The unrest sparked by the death of 22-year-old Masa Amini, who uh, died after being arrested by Iran's morality, so-called morality police, accused of violating the country's strict dress code. And joining me now is Masi Alinejad, an Iranian journalist and activist who has been targeted by the Iranian regime. And Karim Sajapour, a junior, excuse me, senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, where he focuses on Iran and, of course, U.S. policy, foreign policy in the Middle East. Karim, first to you, you live near Avin prison. Um, tell us about the fortifications around there. And do we think that this started inside the prison? It's difficult to say, Andrea. Evin Prison is, is prime real estate in northern Tehran, and it was initially built for something like 300 prisoners in the 1970s, and there's now close to 20,000 prisoners. So it's a sprawling mm -hmm. complex. I used to live across the street from Evin Prison, and I actually called a friend of mine the night of the, of the fire, and I asked them to go out on their balcony. I had actually woken them up in the middle of the night, and I could hear um, the entire building chanting in unison, death to Khamenei, death to the dictator, cars honking their horns. And as you alluded to, it was a very uh, terrifying evening for the families of these political prisoners who were uncertain about the fates of their loved ones. And uh, let me also ask Masi about this, because the women's movement has spread well, actually globally now, because there's reporting that, I, uh, according to Ali Aruzi, our man in Tehran, that a woman athlete for the first time in South Korea competing in games has taken off her head covering. This female athlete representing Iran at the Asian climbing competition finals in Seoul, refusing to wear her headscarf. So do you think that this is not only spreading around the world, but that this will actually lead to more support from women and women's leaders around the, around the globe? Exactly. I mean, the sense of the unity that we see not only among Iranians, among people around the world, across the globe, is uh, significant. And uh, I have to actually tell you that many people who I am in touch with saying that we do our best to take back to the streets, and now they're for international communities, for democratic countries to take a strong action. Uh, many of them actually signing petitions saying, that we want the Western countries to recall their ambassadors, uh, to kick out all the diplomats from Islamic Republic from the Western countries. And this is how uh, they, the West can send the right signal uh, to Iranian people who are risking their lives uh, in the streets. And Karim, uh, on uh, Podcast America, a Pod Save America, rather, the podcast, um, we have the audio of President Obama, uh, I think this was on Friday, posted Friday, mm -hmm. uh, saying it was a mistake for the United States when he was president not to support the Green Revolution in 2009. And the, the thinking back then, we understand from other advisors, was that that might lead the Ayatollah to say, well, it was American-sponsored and not homegrown. But already we've seen Raisi saying exactly that about what Joe Biden said this weekend in supporting the, the protest. But let's, let's play the, the sound of Barack Obama. In retrospect, I think that was a mistake. Uh, every, every time we see a flash, uh, a, um, a glimmer of, of hope, of, of people longing for freedom, I think we have to point it out. We have to shine a spotlight on it. We have to express some solidarity about it. Would it have made a difference if the United States had shown some leadership on this issue in 2009? You know, these counterfactuals are always impossible to, to predict, Andrea, but I, I would say that what's important is that Jake Sullivan, who's the current national security advisor, who was then an aide to Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, 
I think his takeaway from 2009 was that whether America does zero out of 10 to help protesters in Iran or 10 out of 10, the regime in Tehran is always going to label these protesters as American and Israeli lackeys. And it behooves the United States to do everything to try to help the cause of representative government in Iran, because this is perhaps one of the most anti-American regimes in the world. And a representative government in Tehran would be a positive ge geopolitical game changer for the United States. Masi, do you want to weigh in on this? Yeah, exactly. Look, um, right now, President Zelensky actually announced that the Iranian regime providing drones to attack Ukrainians, innocent people. This is act of war. And but you see Putin, Maduro, Khamenei, China, they are more united than democratic countries, pro-democracy uh, countries. They have to stick with their own values. As Karim mentioned, whether they help or support Iranians, pro-democracy, pro-freedom uh, fighters, they're gonna or not, they're going to label America. So it's better for American government, for the Western countries to support democracy, not against autocracy. I strongly believe that the world without Islamic Republic will be a much safer, safer place for everyone, not only for Iranians. Mm. And Karim, one quick point here is that it's very clear that the JCPOA, the nuclear deal, is dead. You know, they were holding out hope, you know, maybe they could negotiate something. There's no way, given that they're Iranian drones siding with Russia against Ukraine, you know, there, there is just no way at this stage, and of course, rep repressing their own people, that we could enter any kind of deal which would lift sanctions and give them billions of dollars. I think that's definitely true that for the foreseeable future. There was a debate within the administration. If Iran got desperate enough to come back and say to the United States, that deal you offered us three months ago, we'll take it now. I think the administration was divided. But the facts on the ground in Tehran, I think, have probably convinced the president that at this time of a national uprising in Iran, the United States can't possibly come to the rescue and empower a regime uh, which is, is trying to crush the spirits of, of uh, peaceful protesters for freedom. Karim Sajapur and Masih Alinejad, thank you both so much.